Now, on first Sundays, as you always know, I'm usually preaching on Sunday, but my mentor, one of my mentors and good friends, happens to be in town. Uh, we have been um, working, as you know, here in the city of Berkeley and uh, Richmond, Sacramento, uh, Stockton, uh, we're even down in Fresno, San Bernardino, Los Angeles, and those are just the California cities. We're all literally in 10 or so states across the country uh, working to activate churches, uh, congregations living or existing in urban neighborhoods to address gun violence and to make sure that we are peacemakers. How many of you know when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God, that uh, that does not give us any room as followers of Jesus to not be agents of God's peace. Hello, somebody. Amen. And so uh, today uh, I'm so blessed uh, to have uh, one of the architects of the ways in which we have been formed to do uh, church-based, faith-based activism and intervention around gun violence. He's here with us. Um, he's here because some of the violence in this region has started to kick up a little bit, even though we've had record reductions. Um, we've had 50% of gun violence um, acts, both homicides and shootings, in Oakland has dropped by 50% in the last five years because of our collective work, amen? In Richmond, it's dropped by almost 70% because of our collective work. In Stockton, it's dropped by, I think, 40% in the last 18 months because of our collective work. Sacramento is dropping, and so um, because we've had some great reductions, anytime a little uptick happens, we all try to really get our brains wrapped around it. And so uh, Pastor Jeff Brown uh, is here in town. He's been in Los Angeles. Man, he was in Los Angeles earlier this week working with some pastors. And then I think he was in Stockton yesterday. And he'll be meeting with us in Oakland tomorrow. And uh, I wanted to have him come back and preach. He's preached here before, even though he can't remember. Amen. Which shows the kind of imp impact we made. Amen. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> uh, and we're so glad to have him. He has a, a great TED talk. If you ever want to see a TED talk on how the ministers and faith leaders worked with a number of different partners in the city of Boston to reduce gun violence among young people. It was called the Boston Miracle. And uh, he leads now a national network of uh, faith leaders and practitioners and others uh, in an organization called Recap, Rebuilding Every Community Around Peace. And I'm so glad to have him here. He was a a longtime pastor at Union Baptist Church in Boston, Massachusetts, and now is one of the associate ministers at 12th Street Avenue Baptist Church, historic church in Boston. And I'm so glad to have uh, our good friend, uh, and he is the spokesperson for the King of Glory. Stand to your feet, everybody, and let's welcome the great, wonderful Reverend Jeff Brown as he comes to preach the Word of God. Can somebody in this place give God some praise? Do you know that God is worthy of all of your praise? Can somebody stand up and say hallelujah? Can somebody say glory to God? Did the Lord woke you up? Did he wake you up this morning? Did he start you on your way? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated, you may be seated. I am so happy and so glad to be here uh, this morning and to share with you here at The Way. Um, it's just an honor to be in the presence of your pastor one more time. And how many of you know that not only is he a national leader, but he is also a jewel in the household of faith. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I, I love him like a, a son or a younger brother. Maybe I shouldn't act like I'm so old. But um, both him and his brother Ben are leaders in this country. And we're going to be able to turn it all around because of dedicated leaders of faith like the McBride brothers. Can I get an amen on that one? I'm 
is always talking about me, but you know, I don't, I don't get on TV like he gets on TV. And, um, but we're just blessed to just be in his presence and to be able to share. I was talking to my wife this morning and she said, you know, you, why do you sound like Barry White? <laughs> I said, it's, you know, because in Boston it's 40 degrees right now. So I came out here and it's springtime and all of my allergies said, it's time to wake up. And I, I said, well, baby, don't, don't you like my voice like this? And she said, no. So um, I'm going to be preaching this morning, but if you just forgive me, uh, there's some, something going on there. I'm not claiming it. Amen. But uh, we'll be able to at least say a, a word. Um, and I'm, I'm Baptist. I know this is a, you know, he's, he's Pentecostal. I'm, I'm Baptist. And so I have to ask him, how long should I preach? Because, you know, Baptist preachers can go for a long time, but just for a few minutes, if I can say, just a few minutes, let me, let me say something on this. I've been arrested over the past three weeks, maybe, during the Linden season, and as we went into Easter, by a text that was read by someone, and he was going somewhere else, but this 12th verse just arrested me, and so I'd like to go over the scripture if it's all right. And to be able to, to just get this out of my spirit. You know, sometimes the Lord sits on you. And he says, you know, you, you, you might want to preach one of your oldies but goodies. But uh, you, you're going to have to be fresh this morning. So if it's all right with you, I'm going to work it out right in front of you. And do y'all say amen here at the way? I, Y'all give God the glory. All right. All right. I, I'm reminded of a story of a young man who preached um, in a church. And, um, you know, he decided since he was a scholar and seminary trained that he, his congregation would deal with uh, the, his scholarship. And so he decided to preach from the Graf Westerhouse theory of the documentary hypothesis. And he decided to put a Talikian twist on it. And as he preached, you know, in our tradition, people talk back to you. And as he was preaching, ain't nobody said nothing. I think there was a lady in the back who said, help him, Lord. <laughs> and when he, when he got done, he tried to get out the church uh, you know, sneak out as quickly as he could. An old lady grabbed him and said, what's wrong with you, boy? And he said, nothing wrong with me. He said, listen, you need to understand that not everybody is a giraffe like you. You got to learn how to put it where everybody can get it. So this morning, I'm going to try to put it where everybody can get it. Amen? From the book of Luke, and the 23rd chapter. And although we're looking at 1 to 12, I decided to start at verse 5. And it's in the New International Version. And it reads like this. But they, and that's the religious leadership, insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. He hoped to see him perform some sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. 
Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. And here's the verse that has caught my attention. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. If I had a subject for you this morning, it would be dangerous praise. Look at your neighbor and say, dangerous praise. Look at another neighbor and say, dangerous praise. Look behind you and say, you dangerous, baby. <laughs> Recently, there was a PBS special that was put on by Henry Louis Gates, and it was called Reconstruction. And what's interesting about that PBS special, and you ought to see it, is that it tells the Civil War and the aftermath of it in a very different way than has been told in the United States before. When you think about the other specials about the Civil War and the afterwards, the Ken Burns editions that they would have out there, it really talks about the war itself and the struggle of the soldiers and their heroism, et cetera. But Henry Louis Gates tells the perspective of reconstruction from below. He tells it from the perspective of the slaves, our forebearers, those who had suffered under the weight of oppression and how that era of reconstruction, rather than being a beacon light for the community, it was a dangerous time. And so in that uh, uh, reconstruction special, he talks about the end of the Civil War, and he talks about Appomattox, which was the place in Virginia where Robert E. Lee rode in to officially give the keys of the Confederate Army to Grant. And Appomattox occurred on a Sunday. And the people who were our forebearers rejoiced when they began to hear the word of that. And there were so many in Virginia who left their plantations and started looking for loved ones who had been previously sold to other families. That happened on a Sunday. That Tuesday, uh, the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, gave a speech. And when he gave a speech, he started talking about how we are in a new nation, and that perhaps the time has come to start the process to allow black people to vote. And in the audience that Tuesday, a man leaned over to his friend and said, this is the last time that we will hear a speech like that from Abraham Lincoln. And that Friday, when Lincoln was at the Ford Theater, that man whose name was John Wilkes Booth took a gun, aimed it at the head of President Abraham Lincoln and shot him to death. Now, I tell you that story because it relates in an odd way to our text this morning. Because here we have Jesus being brought by the religious authorities to Pilate. And the reason that they give uh, that he is there is because this man has stirred up all kinds of trouble. In fact, they say that it's because of what happened on the Sunday before that justified their bringing Jesus there. On the Sunday before, Jesus came in Jerusalem. 
And you know the story. There were folks who took their cloaks and they put them in the aisle there. And, and then as he was on that donkey, they started waving palm branches. And they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is the one that cometh in the name of the Lord. And it goes from Sunday with praise to Friday with Jesus being in front of Pilate. And I say that just to sort of reiterate the first point I have for you this morning, that if you are going to give Jesus the praise, you need to understand that there will be a reaction to that praise. And that reaction means to diminish and, and minimize the name of Jesus. Now, I, I used to play football. I, I look at your pastor, he looked like he might have been a football player too. Or maybe now, praise the Lord. <laughs> but I used to play football, and I'm not ashamed to say that I remember I was on a team, and we were 1 and 10 at the end of the season. And when we were sitting there, and this is no lie, my coach came before us to talk and to summarize what happened. He says, I, I love you all. You all are a great team. And, and you know what? You would have been 11 and 0 if it wasn't for the other team that was out on the field. <laughs> See, what y'all need to understand is when you stand up and give God some praise, when you give God some glory, there's another team out there that means to minimize you. As a matter of fact, if you are sincere in your praise, you become a particular target of the enemy. Now, you ain't got to say amen. I know I'm right. So I come to you this morning to tell you that if you're going to give God some praise, you need to be serious about that praise. Don't just come in here and watch the praise dancers and, and watch the praise singers and, and, and just follow the instructions because you're supposed to. You need to give God the praise because what God has done in your life. You need to give God the praise for who he is. As a matter of fact, the truth be told, I wouldn't know if you're serious in your praise unless you're praising God during the times when you don't feel like you're favored by God. Now, I need you all to do something for me. Put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder. Now, push it and tell him to wake up. I need you to understand something. If you're going to be serious about praising God, if you're going to be serious about giving God the glory, you need to give God the glory when things are all right and when things are not all right. You need to give God the praise during the good times and the bad times. You need to give God the praise when your belly is full and when your belly is empty. If you got a doctor's uh, examination and the doctor says things aren't looking good, that's not the time to be sorry for yourself or, or to feel sad. That's a time to give God some praise. Because whether you're rich or whether you're poor, God is God and he's worthy of the praise. Whether you have it all or whether you have nothing, God is God. All right. All right. I'm on. I'm I'm going to leave that alone. I, I'm, I'm trying to preach the Baptist way. Man, I need to get to, the, get to the way and be cool since I'm out here in California. Yeah. So let me just slide on to the second point then. In the second point, you see Jesus before Pilate and the religious authorities accusing him. And then Pilate says, uh, is, is he a Galilean? And they say, yes, he's a Galilean. And so he says, send him over there to Antipas. It says Herod, but this is Herod Antipas because he was the Tetrarch of Galilee at the time. And so they send Jesus to Herod. And, and, you, and you see there's a, an interaction there. Herod is excited because he's wondering within himself uh, uh, if this man is going to produce a miracle for him. 
And so he goes to Jesus and he says, come on now, you know, you're in front of me. Let me see what you got. And Jesus says not a word to him. And so uh, they start mocking him, and the religious leaderships are vehement in their accusations of him. And then finally, Herod puts a purple robe on him and sends him on his way and sends him back to Pilate. And a strange thing happens during that time. Herod and Pilate become friends. So here we have the secular leadership of the day and the religio-political leadership of the day joining together against Jesus. I say this because I wanted to announce this. I, I'm a student of history, but, and I'm not sure how history will record the last eight years, eight or 10 years that, that we've been living, but I think it's gonna record it in, in some way like this. In 2008, we elected the first black president of the United States. And his name was Barack Obama. And, and somewhere after the first year of his election, there was an uprising. There was a reaction to the fact that he was a black president. You ain't gotta say amen, I know I'm right. And they decided at that point to attack him and every policy that he would bring before them, they would find something wrong with it. In fact, the Senate leader whose name is Mitch McConnell said that I believe that we're going to make Barack Obama a one term president, but he lasted for eight years, hallelujah. But then after eight years, that reaction culminated itself where we had the election, and I'm afraid to call his name here in California, uh, uh, but y'all know who I'm talking about. His hair is orange, come on, somebody. He became president of the United States. And what has been galling to me, and I know it's been galling to your pastor, is that the affirmation of the presidency of this current president has been affirmed by evangelicals. It's been affirmed by religious leaders. And there are some who are actually saying that we have been praying that God would bring this man to the level of president of the United States. What I'm trying to let you know is that the reason why your praise needs to be serious is because your praise brings the kind of reaction that solidifies the forces of those who do not want the change that Jesus brings. See, see Jesus came in order to change this world. Uh, he changed the way people saw God. He changed the way how people ought to relate to God's people. And when he came into Jerusalem, people were all around him because they expected that change to come. But you know, there's an old saying that people change when the cost of not changing becomes too great. And so you have folk who have investments in things the way they are. And they decide to rise up against the change agent because they like things the way they are. I see that this is a modern church, but you know, I come from a Baptist church. And when I was pre uh, a pastor in that church, it was 120 years old. And I had members who were 120. Come on, somebody. And when I came in, I was 25 years old. And so I know what the Lord was telling me. The problem was they also knew what the Lord was telling me, but didn't want any of it. Oh, come on, somebody. You know, they, they didn't like the way I was preaching. They, they didn't like the progressive vision that was coming. They were looking at me cross-eyed. There were folks who would get mad at me because they, they see me cross uh, across the communion table. Come on, somebody. As if there's something in the Bible that says, thou shalt not cross over the communion table. Is there anybody listening to what I'm trying to say? What I'm trying to get you to understand is that for every age and for every generation, 
God raises up a standard of leadership to guide his people through. And sometimes the way things used to be doesn't add up to what we need to be now. I, I don't think I've convinced everybody. I'm, I'm trying, my, you know, I'm going to preach until my voice goes out. I just want y'all to know that. I know y'all can hear that, but what I'm trying to get you to see is that God has always been a God of change. He's always been a God of evolution. That, that, that for every age, there is a moment in time where God's people have to speak. But there will always be a reaction. The Herods of the world will get together with the pilots of the world and they will stand firm against the resistance. You see it right now. We got, you know, the Democrats got at least 49 people <laughs> running for president of the United States. And all of them think that they the change agent. Come on, somebody. And then we got one orange dude on the other side. And there are people who are saying uh, it's gonna be hard to get him out of office. And it's not because we got 49 people on the Democratic side trying to run for president of the United States. It's because that there are people in this country who like things the way they are. And they are afraid of what happens when the change eventually comes. But I'm here to tell you, if you're a part of the change, you're on the lower side. Because the Lord is about changing this world. It's about transforming this world. Can I get somebody to say hallelujah in this place? I forgot I'm, I'm, I'm here in California. Let me, let me be cool again. Let me just slide on to the last point that I have this morning. Is that all right? Here's, here's the last point. It, the, the, the resistance to change is formidable. There's a lot of money out there. And the truth be told, money talks. Come on, somebody. And there are a lot of folk who got investments in things the way they are. And it looks like the remnant of those who see a new vision. It looks like we're in an uphill battle. Which brings me to my final point. Your praise is dangerous because they don't know who you're praising. Can I say that one more time? Your praise is dangerous because they don't know who you praise. They, they don't know that, that the one who has all the power don't need any money. They don't know that the one who has all the power doesn't need any politics. Matter of fact, when Jesus was on this earth, everything he did was impolitic. Everything that he did flew in the face of things the way they were. A man with a withered hand comes up to him. And the leadership is saying, you can't do anything because it's the Sabbath day. But Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. And the hand was healed. There was a man who was at the pool of Bethesda for 49 years. And, and he was just laying there. And, and when Jesus got there, he said, I don't have anybody to put me in the water when it's stirred by the angel. But then Jesus said, get up off of that bed and walk. There was a man named Lazarus who got sick and his sister sent for Jesus. And Jesus waited for two days to make sure that Lazarus died. But when he got there, after the funeral, after the burial, he said, move the stone away. Called his name Lazarus. Come forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave. They don't know, church. 
They don't know the power you serve. They don't know the glory you serve. They don't know the God you serve. So stand on your feet and act like you know who rules this world, who rules this universe. His name is Come on, give the Lord a hand praise if you're glad that you know who you praising and who rules. 